Роман, вы, пожалуйста, будете в камеру записывать, чтобы она была не без Uh, this 
chart is just to show you, if you need any data to be convinced, of the relevance that was being uh, uh, got in the academic debate over recent years. As you can, this is the number of publications uh, on well-being, on the economics of happiness, that have been uh, referenced in equal between 1986 and 2011. And you can see that from 1998, 1998 onward, the number of publications definitely skyrocketed. And there are also various other tools that have been developed uh, for measuring people who are being. Uh, this looks a bit like a DNA chain, but actually it is not. It is a hedonometer. Hedonometer is a tool that has been developed by I don't know who for uh, measuring well being in a fancy way. Actually, they scan every day millions of Twitter that are tweets that are, that are exchanged among Twitter users. And based on the prevalence of some words and some others, they measure the well-being associated to that specific day. So the various colors show you for the various days of the week the level of happiness as measured by the prevalence of some positive versus some negative words. And here there is a little example, I'm sorry that you cannot read it from, from that distance, but basically it predicts which uh, items have contributed in which way to the definition of well-being on this specific day, the 25th of December 2008. And basically you can see that uh, this uh, measure of well-being, what well, this level of well-being that is approximately beyond 6.35 depends in a large part by the prevalence of words such as Christmas, family, family, this I cannot do it myself, happy, holidays. So basically they've done what they've done is to associate some positive score to some positive words and some negative one to some negative words. And then just aggregate that over time. So there is a lot of these initiatives going on. This is probably one of the most fancy going on, but uh, the NEF, the New Economic Foundation from London, is developing the own Happy Planet Index. There are many initiatives in this direction. Yeah, there is a Russian saying, there is no such thing as a good morning. As a good morning. <laughs> yes, especially, this is especially true for Mondays. And we actually don't actually open the stage. Absolutely. <laughs> it's very really fun. Indeed, the prevalence of blue is associated with Mondays and is almost, almost always at the lower end. The search for happiness is a long-lasting debate uh, started already in the uh, ancient Greece, <coughs> went on through uh, the Declaration of Independence of the United States, came to more modern uh, <coughs> relevance, as I tried to emphasize before. Uh, in the 1970s, um, even uh, Bhutan became famous because they declared that they didn't care about GDP, but they were mostly interested in gross. Uh, national happiness. So there is a huge research going on on this. But what is subjective well-being and how do we measure it? Um, the quest for measures of well-being is uh, one has been one uh, a light motif for economists. Time and economists are looking at this from this perspective. And the best we could come uh, with during the last 200 years was basically the history of utility functions. Basically, the assumption is that uh, people are happier depending on how much they are able to consume. So that uh, if these are uh, different curves associated with higher levels of utility, actually someone is happier if he manages, manages to climb across in different curves toward higher in different curves, which are associated with higher utility. Obviously, this is not answering the question because still we don't know what is utility. Everybody can say his opinion about what should be considered in a utility function, what not. And then, of course, there is the critique by said on why we have some if the utility is the same across uh, generations and so on. So, uh, I would not emphasize much 
this, uh, this measure. There are other solutions that have been adopted to measure the well-being of people. Uh, for example, the incidence of mental illnesses, suicide rates, the diffusion of alcoholism, uh, crime rates, individual exposure to pollutants, anxiety, the, the, the frequency of the incidence of cardiovascular diseases. These are probably more measures of bad being rather than well being, but they could still be considered as the opposite of that bad being. What is the problem with these measures? Is that sometimes these indicators are cumbersome to provide and they might require some people that are specialists in order to monitor this, this, this dimension. And uh, very often they don't make much sense when we uh, want to measure well being at individual level. So, what is the big innovation that came through after the Second World War onward? Well, that is mainly the work of psychologists, uh, by positive psychologists and then subsequently by sociologists, that basically in, in 1950s the psychologists started being concerned more about what makes people happy rather than what makes people unhappy or ill. Ill. So they started asking a very naive question, that is, uh, what is happiness? And they started asking question, this question to people and to measure using various uh, methods, various scales, various questions, how people, uh, if people are happy or not. And uh, they started testing and showing that these measures are reliable, are easy to monitor and provide also interesting insights. Let's have a look. First of all, what do we mean by subjective well-being? Well, subjective well-being is exactly what it means. That is to say, a personal evaluation of a person's life. That is to say, what each of us consider as good for his life. Uh, it includes various domains, satisfaction, pleasant affect, and low negative affect. We will go through these issues in a short while. But what has to be emphasized is that subjective well-being is our own assessment of our own life and not what an expert considers. So it's our own declaration. Um, as anticipated, subjective well-being uh, is made of various dimension, that is to say there are emotional responses such as how happy are we, contains answers to a set of questions about how satisfied we are in various domains of our life, like our familiar life, job satisfaction, and so on, and includes also global judgments of our satisfaction. This is why it is generally uh, a knowledge that subjective well-being is made, is a concept made of two parts, affective and cognitive part, where the first one, the affective part, is an evaluation guided by emotion and feelings. Usually, uh, the, the, the psychologists refer to this dimension as the one proxied by feelings of happiness that are mood related, temporary, and change a lot over time. The second part, the cognitive part, is an information based appraisal of one's life, and it is usually considered a more stable and reliable measure of well being because it is one in which people meditate more before giving it some opinion. Uh, the, so as I participated, the first one is associated with happiness, the second one is sometimes referred to as life satisfaction. But very often life satisfaction, subjective what the happiness are used interchangeably. So what uh, is what? The three words stand for three different issues, for three different domains. The problem is that sometimes they are interchangeably used in the literature to proxy each other. So it should be clear that uh, they do not mean the, th the same thing, but in general speak words they are sometimes used as if they were the same. And this is partly because life satisfaction and happiness are at least in part positively correlated. Uh, very often, subjective well being as an indicator includes both life satisfaction and happiness. Uh, but uh, it has been 
show that uh, very often life satisfaction and happiness behave differently over time and have different relationship with other variables. These are two standard uh, ways of asking questions of subjective well-being that are, uh, these are, they come from the World Bank Survey. And uh, there are various ways to measure subjective well-being. In this case, in the World Bank Survey, uh, the researchers prefer to measure it with single item questions. That is to say, one question asking to read how happy you are or how satisfied you are. And uh, in the first case, uh, the answer can range on a one to four point scale from very happy to not at all happy. In the second case, we ask people to think and to evaluate how satisfied they are in their life, providing answers on a scale from one to ten, from dissatisfied to satisfied. But this is not the only solution. Psychologists have developed um, a wealth of scales that uses multi-item questions. Sometimes there are scales that use up to 44 or even 70 different items to measure well-being of one single person. You can imagine this is a kind of quite cumbersome task, but it has its advantages. In these cases, I'm uh, showing you a measure that got quite some fortune in the, in the literature, in fact, in the psychological one, probably because it is still a multi-item question that is considered as preferable compared to the single one. And the reason is because multi-item questions allow to uh, monitor more than one uh, dimension. Uh, but at the same time, this is still kind of synthetic, where I um, indicate or measure what uh, In this case, this is the satisfaction with life scale and people asked to uh, declare whether they agree or disagree with uh, um, a set of questions. <coughs> and in this case, the answers that can be provided range on a 1 to 7 scale, where 1 stands for strongly disagree, there is a midpoint that is for neither agree or disagree, and the maximum is on these 7 points that stands for strongly agree. And this is, these are the five questions to which each respondent is asked to provide an answer on, based on the previous screen I'll show you. The first one is, in most ways my life is close to my ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I am satisfied with my life. So far I've gotten the important things I want in life. If I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. So, what psychologists do is to go uh, to each of their uh, respondents and ask to answer to each of these questions on a scale from 1 to 7, as I showed you before. So, they assign a value to each point and then they sum it. And the score that they can get ranges on a scale from 5 to 35, where 5 is very unhappy and 35 is very happy. And uh, if you don't mind, I would be happy if I could ask you the same question. Could I kindly ask you to note down on the paper that you are being given by Tatiana to answer to each of these questions? This is a measurement of objective will be of our world. Is it anonymous? Yes, it's anonymous. No, you, should, you should put your name. <laughs> We will collect the uh, piece of paper and uh, we, we will not know who answered the time. Ah. Shall we also sum it up already for you? It would be highly appreciated because my computational skills are limited. So seven is the best, yeah? Seven is the best, and one is the best. Seven is the best, I'm sorry. I can show you the, the scale again. Ah, yeah. Now show us the questions. <laughs> I, I, I put down too many questions. <laughs> Uh, so the, the answers 
are just one set of expressions from one this strongly is disagree to seven strongly agree with uh, the midpoint neither agree or disagree. And the questions are in most ways my life is close to my ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I am satisfied with my life. So far I have gotten the important things I want in life. If I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. So I would like to measure your know, well-being now. And let me measure it again at the end of this session and we see how I impacted on your well-being. I'm kidding. We stop here because I don't want to get the ideas. We also have about 20 minutes left, I oh, think. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. them this way. Thank you. Do we need any sorts of demographic? <laughs> no. Not now. <laughs> Thank you. Your monthly income is enough. <laughs> <coughs> So just give me a few seconds to So that we can compare them. This has not been summed up. Oh, they have to be summed up. Oh. It's, it's not. We will get some listeners. We will impute them to them. Four four eight and four twelve and six eighteen and seven twenty five. Fifteen and seven twenty two and seven twenty nine.
Yeah, I'm trying to look, to look her or him up. There's one more. Wow. Have a miss, yeah. Ah, uh, the older means were longer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> ah. 
but I think it's probably that they are still not working. So being in the convent really <laughs> decreases. <laughs> so we can do many of these comparisons in, in a significant uh, uh, way, in various, in various ways. Are these uh, uh, reliable? Can we trust this course? Well, there are uh, two forms of tests that have been done on this issue. One that is a bit less explored is the test we test uh, experiment to check if asking twice the same question to the same person at a different point of time provides consistent results. But <laughs> from this, we have that when it comes to multi-item questions such as the one you have answered, the correlation is a bit higher when compared to single item issues. But uh, the results are much more encouraging when we look at another form of, um, of, of reliability, that is to say, if indeed these uh, subjective measures of well-being reflect some other uh, more objective measures of well-being. And here the, there are plenty of interesting results showing very encouraging uh, figures. Uh, I would just mention two, but there is quite a bit. One is uh, comes from the cold virus experiments. What they've done is just to provide uh, uh, a, a random of uh, a random, to a random group of people the virus of cold, and then to measure uh, among others the happiness of the energeticness of the group, uh, and then they have checked uh, taking the happier part of the group and the less happy part of the group, and then they have noticed that. Those who have themselves to be active has a lower probability of developing the virus of cold. And among those who uh, heal faster, there were those who reported to be happier. And Please. Sorry, and happiness was measured in that experiment exactly the same way that we just measured it now. How was happiness determined in that, in that experiment? The cold virus experiment, I don't know if they use the multi multi item or a single item, I think life satisfaction was the question. And what they've done is just to ask the same, exactly the same question to the same people. Yes. Chris, we can do the same with those two. So? We can do the same with those two. No thanks, I was just be up wondering if the same measure or if they were determined to be happy using another word. Sorry? Never mind, that's fine. Well, I'll address it later. Well, they did something similar, providing people with uh, slight wounds, and they discovered that people are happy and tend to recover faster from their wounds. Uh, and another quite uh, strong uh, proof is that it comes from neuroscience research. You know that uh, our brain, uh, at least neuroscientists, have discovered that various parts of our brain are associated with specific activities and with specific areas of also well-being. In particular, it seems that the prefrontal cortex of our left cortex of our brain uh, seems to be mainly active when we experience uh, pleasure well-being. And uh, actually, uh, this is what uh, has been proved by some of the scientists. But also, it's plenty of I will just keep this part to go a bit faster than the last part. Uh, also, um, so beyond some objective uh, measures of well being that correlate with the subjective measures of well being, we have the fact that uh, um, subjective measures correlate positively also with assessments of our own well being made by people who know us well. For example, our friends or relatives. That is to say, uh, our perceived well being is similar to the one that someone who knows us well would say about us. Uh, plus, both life satisfaction and happiness have meaningful association with many domains chronic pain, unemployment, uh, income, and right to the income distribution. Uh, self reported health, quality, sleep, quality, age. So, what uh, has become clear is that uh, uh, subjective measures of well being are easy to measure, are an individual level to measure, and uh, can help uh, also uh, interesting stories. This is why, for example, economists, in, in my case, from my point of view, I started wondering 
how subjective well being considered as a dependent variable is affected by a set of explanatory uh, variables. In particular, assuming that the measure of well being that we can observe reflects a latent concept that is the true well being experienced by the respondent. And then, if this association makes sense, we can try to uh, represent it in some functional form, such as a standard uh, linear regression or uh, in more moderate probability of logic or more complex models. I will skip on the issues that uh, are associated with this kind of operationalization of what being, because I think, uh, well, if you want to get back to this, whether we can consider what being as a binary or also ordinal measure, if we should use a linear model versus ordered ones, and of course the evergreen issue of causality. But uh, if well-being is uh, reliable and meaningful, and if it can tell us something interesting about modern societies, what we can do is to try, for example, to compare it across countries. And this is what, uh, for example, uh, the New Economic Foundation of London started doing, making a ranking of uh, the happier countries in the world. And in this case, you would see without much surprise that in the first six we have various Northern European countries, but then the situation becomes more mixed. We can also assess those who are least happy. And definitely, you wouldn't like to live in Togo, at least if you care for your well being, sorry. Why did Russia? Russia is in between. Uh, in between. In between. <laughs> No, no, I, I'm sorry, I'm not there. No, let's move closer to the end or to the other end. No, but I just look back because I, I had the impression that um, probably I showed this figure already elsewhere. And I remember that I included some dots to show countries more down to the ranking. But it's a different thing. And did you remove Ghana? <laughs> <laughs> Ghana, yeah, Ghana is always in the rank of the top countries, and I noticed there's a gap there. I swear I need to Okay. okay. Probably is the, 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 no, but you see, Italy, you see that, yeah, there is no up to 10, then uh, it's a bit. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, random then. Yeah. A bit random. A bit random. And uh, let's come to the history of paradox. Let's start. Uh, Step by step. The first issue is that, okay, we have the ranking of countries. How much time do we have? Six minutes. Okay. Uh, if we can rank countries from the least happy to the most happy, we can also have fun and correlate this uh, happiness score by countries <coughs> with the GDP per country, the index of wealth of a country. And uh, this is, these are two charts taken from one of the many issues of the economist, showing that if we plot uh, the GDP per capita, in this case it's 2003, but we don't care about this, with, uh, versus the mean life satisfaction of each country, what we found is a positive correlation between these two dimensions, where richer countries are happier, in this case are more satisfied with their lives. If we linearize this uh, relationship by considering the logarithm of GDP greater than GDP, so we move to this chart, we notice that this could be linear relationship turns straight. Linear. Yeah. <clears throat> One remark on this chart. Very often we hear that uh, there is a threshold in the relationship between GDP and well-being. A threshold that is sometimes put around twelve and fifteen thousand dollars per capita of GDP. So it is more or less something here. When we speak about this measure, we are speaking about this chart. It is this the curve and this is this the threshold where the relationship with GDP and less satisfaction starts smoothing down. So the returns from higher GDP in terms of well-being 
are decreasing. Still, the richer are happier. No surprise on this. This is another uh, example of uh, uh, what I was showing you before. Even probably more clearer, clearer than the chart from uh, the economies. So there is actually a positive correlation in this case of 0.26 when we consider uh, within country relationship between income and uh, happiness in this case. So here what Stevenson and Wolfers have done is to correlate individual income within country with people's happiness within country. And what they found is that also within country, those who are happier are richer. And this is perfectly fine with every theory you could think about. So what is the problem? What is the Easterling paradox? The Easterling paradox raises when we move from a cross-sectional picture, as the one I showed you before, to a picture where we compare trends over time. So this is the example of the Easterling paradox related to US, as Easterling itself found out in 1974, I guess. This is probably from another paper. However, what we have here this time is not GDP on the x-axis. We have time. And we plot how GDP and the percentage of very happy have changed over time in the US. And we found this discrepancy between GDP and happiness, very happy in this case, which suggests that even though people grow on average richer because GDP has been increasing, their happiness has been not increasing, if not stagnating. And this is surprising. This is the paradox. Because if at any point in time those who are richer are happier, then I don't see why over time becoming richer is not associated with becoming happier, which is also the promise of economic growth. We push economic growth because we believe that economic growth makes us happier. And this result holds even if rather than considering the percentage of very happy people in the US, we consider average happiness. So I here the story goes uh, very uh, long. I, I also wanted to provide you some uh, explanation of the historical paradox and some interpretation if you will be probably at this point and rather that time. But uh, I at least hope I managed to uh, make a few points of this presentation clear. If you have questions, I will be happy to, to answer. Thank you. We have indeed run out of time, but thank you, Francesco, very much. I suggest that those who would like to take a break before the next class can leave at this moment, and those who would like to, uh, to stay and ask questions can stay and ask questions. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, something I've always wondered about in relation to all of the research on subjective well-being and, and happiness, something in me doesn't trust it. Uh, I don't trust the validity of it because um, it, it, in order for us to answer, answer these questions that come up in the survey, whether life satisfaction or happiness, it requires two steps. First of all is making a self-appraisal, you know, how, how am I feeling or how do I think that I'm doing in life? And the second step is, is reporting this to, to an outsider, either to an anonymous person who's collecting a, a survey or, or to, to a friend. So these two steps, self-appraisal and, and reporting, are both culturally variable. In other words, how do we know that the results that we're getting are really have anything to do with subjective well-being? And they, they could be rather uh, cultures of optimism or cultures of low self-critique or cultures in, in which we are more likely to positively self-evaluate ourselves. And, and, and the, the best example is the U.S. When you ask someone, you know, how, how you're doing, well, they're always 
always fine or always great. It's a little bit taboo to say, oh, you just had a terrible day. They had to put your, your I had to put my dog to sleep or something like this. This is, <laughs> this is just not acceptable, right? So uh, you get what my point is. So how do we know that we're really looking at cultural variation and subjective well-being as opposed to cultural variation in something like optimism, for example? Flat trends of well-being across time. 
because if on average uh, we have uh, uh, higher well-being only for short term, then we get back to our long-term path. Overall, we can have only fluctuations around our uh, long-term level of well-being. And this on average will provide a flat track, which is actually what happens in the US. But it's not what happens in uh, other countries, uh, as has been shown by Stevenson and Wolfers, England, in the UK, or couple of years or so, I will not show you this, uh, all these charts just to convince you that happiness is not flat across countries, it is flat only in some countries. Uh, this is Italy, for example. And, uh, 1994 is when Berlusconi was elected in Italy. Oh. <coughs> uh, Sweden. Okay. So the problem with those theories is that they don't uh, allow us to explain the, the patterns. And uh, I finish. So the hypothesis of which I've been working is the so-called uh, negative endogenous growth model that suggests that economic growth can be the outcome of some, uh, of some uh, negative externalities affecting the consumption of something that is very important for our well-being. And if you're interested to learn more about this, you have to read my papers. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last question concerning uh, the issue raised by Chris. I totally see your point. <laughs> And uh, I don't have a definitive answer to your question, except that there are some papers showing that uh, if we take the happiness equations from various counts,